This meeting is being recorded. Great. So we are um, we're live, and we are going to wait a few minutes uh, to allow the audience to join us, uh, and then we'll get started. We see, uh, yeah, attendees are coming in as we speak. I always say to my students, this is the strangest and awkwardest aspect of of the brave new world of Zoom is everyone sort of sitting quietly staring at a screen with different faces on it until things get going. Great, we've got about 120 participants, fantastic. All right, we'll wait a few more seconds. And we'll uh, end one, then we'll get started. Okay. <laughs> See some nice greetings going back and forth in the chat room, which is great. Okay, it looks like we're uh, the numbers are stabilizing. Actually, we're still going up here, so maybe we'll wait a few more minutes, a few more seconds anyway. All right, I think that's good. Well, good. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening, uh, this very, very snowy evening. Beautiful, but quite snowy evening here in Ottawa. Um, I'm assuming most of you have spent the day in, at home, like the rest of us have, which is not that much different than how we spend every day these days. But uh, but today was uh, especially interesting to watch it just accumulate and accumulate. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the fourth lecture of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism's 2021-22 uh, forum lecture series. And this is the first of three presentations in the winter term. And my name is Benjamin Gianni. I'm an associate professor uh, in the School of Architecture and a former director of the school. So let me begin by acknowledging the support of our founding sponsors, namely Hoban Architecture, GRC Architecture, Trinity Developments, Charles Fort Developments, IBI Group, uh, and Merkley Supply. And I'm also very pleased to announce that tonight's lecture is the second in our series to be co-sponsored by the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects. And my thanks too to my colleague, Susie harris Brands, who's joining us uh, here on the virtual platform this evening, uh, and to Ellen Parasu and to Maria Cook, who do so much to bring this series to us. You'll notice uh, that the Q&A is active. So uh, those of you who are, are participating tonight are welcome to post in the Q&A and Susie and I will keep track or attempt to keep track of, of comments and direct them to the, uh, to the, the speakers uh, when we get to the uh, discussion period. So this evening, we're very excited to see the work and engage in a discussion with two of Canada's most innovative architectural design firms, namely RDH Architects and GH3 Architects. And we've asked both firms to use their presentation tonight to explore several themes. And the first of these is the role that cultural institutions play in the revitalization of smaller communities and that hard infrastructure like highways, uh, sorry, and the second theme is the overlap between architecture and hard infrastructure like highways and pumping stations. While the third theme is the blurred lines between architecture and landscape. And these three themes are part of what we're calling uh, reassembly, which is the title of our series this, this year, uh, which we could call as a gathering together or the gathering up or putting things together in new and uh, innovative ways. We'll begin tonight's lecture with a presentation on the work of RDA Architects by our first speaker, Tyler Sharp. And following Tyler, Ray Chow will present the work of GH3. We'll then end the evening with a Q&A on some of the themes I've just mentioned, finishing up, we hope, no later than 7.30 p.m. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Susie harris Brantz, and she will introduce uh, RDHA and Tyler Sharp. Susie. Thanks, Ben. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first of this evening's speakers, Tyler Sharp of RDHA. Uh, RDHA is a Toronto-based studio specializing in architecture for the public realm. Founded in 1919, the firm has a wide-ranging body of work encompassing corporate headquarters, industrial facilities, academic buildings, transportation facilities, recreation centers, libraries, security buildings, and interiors. Over the past 15 years, the firm has focused on producing intelligent, concept-driven architecture of the highest caliber. Building on its 100-plus year history, the firm has re-emerged as one of Canada's most acclaimed design offices, 
winning more than 70 provincial, national, and international awards, uh, including notably four Governor General's medals, the 2018 Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Architectural Firm Award, and in relation to tonight's speaker, the 2014 REIC Young Architect Award for a design partner. Uh, Tyler Sharp joined RDHA in 2005, where he's now Principal and Design Director. His projects include the Bloor Gladstone District Library, the Hamilton Central Library and Farmers Market, the Mississauga Public Library, the Watertown Library and Civic Center, the Cambridge Idea Exchange Old Post Office, and the Springdale Library and Tomagatsumaru Park. In addition to the many awards he's received, Tyler's work has been widely published in local, national, and international publications. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Tyler. It's really wonderful to have you. Uh, following the presentation, as Ben said, we'll uh, switch to the kind of open discussion and the question period. Uh, so please put any questions that might emerge along the way uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Tyler, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yeah, uh, all good. So, great, great. Well, thank you to everybody for attending this evening and thank you to Ben and Carlton for reaching out and uh, inviting us to take part in this discussion. Uh, it's great to, to be involved. Um, I, I thought I would begin my talk by first just talking a little bit more about RDHA for those of you who are not as familiar with the firm. Uh, and some of this was already touched on in, in the intro, but RDHA is a, a Toronto-based uh, full-service design practice architecture firm. Um, and um, we are one of Canada's oldest, if not Canada's oldest ongoing architectural practices. The firm has uh, been around for I guess it's 103 years this year, and it's had a, a host of, of different partners and names, and it's taken on a, a variety of different building projects over the years, building types. Um, but the current group of partners, of which there are uh, three partners and owners, myself, Bob Goyesh, and Jeffrey Miller, uh, are first and foremost public architects. And the, the kind of work that we take on is, is pretty much exclusively public sector work. Um, I came to the firm in, in 2005, and when I arrived, I, I had a few different duties. Uh, part of, of what I did was to design my first project at RDHA, which was the Blair Gladstone Library. Um, but in parallel with that, I was involved in a sort of rebranding of the office uh, where the existing partners was lo were looking to, to make a change to produce architecture um, that was, um, you know, previously, you know, solid sort of architecture on time on budget to uh, a firm that was producing architecture of a sort of higher design caliber. And so, so part of it was this rebranding process. And the other part was to start developing a, a sort of consistent design language for the office through my work, which has sort of continued through the work of, of my partner, Jeff and, and Bob as well. Uh, and this, this language has become a language of sort of consistent, uh, well, searching for a sort of consistent language for the office, but also a kind of language for public architecture. So I, I decided to structure the talk tonight around three projects um, that are projects that approach public architecture and infrastructure differently, but also that sort of illustrate to some extent the evolution of this sort of evolving design language for public architecture. So the three sketches that we see on the screen right now are on the left a sketch that represents the Guelph Civic Center uh, Pavilion, which is a project that sort of bridges the space between uh, publicly accessible architecture and sort of non-accessible infrastructure. In the center uh, is the uh, Springdale Library in Kamigata Maru Park, which is more of a, a pure piece of public architecture and publicly accessible architecture. And on the right is the Scott Street interlocking signal tower uh, generator project which is really a more of a pure infrastructure project for, for Metrolinx uh, at Union Station. So the first project is the Guelph Civic Center Pavilion. This is a small project, uh, a transparent public pavilion 
uh, that sits at grade within uh, a civic square in the heart of Guelph. As you can see uh, at grade, it's a publicly accessible pavilion, one that is uh, a space for rest and change, a place for refuge from the elements. Uh, and below grade, uh, it is a piece of more pure infrastructure that services both the space of the pavilion and the greater space of the Civic Center. So here we can see the uh, green rectangle here represents the Civic Square. This is uh, downtown Guelph. This here is the existing uh, City Hall building that was designed by uh, Moriyama Tashima. There's a courthouse building here. And the Civic Square is situated between those buildings within a sort of nice in intact piece of heritage commercial fabric. Um, here's a site plan of the project. This is a bit of a unique project where we weren't the prime consultant. Uh, the prime consultant was a landscape architect, Janet Rosenberg and Associates. And they came to us uh, and asked if we would be involved in the project and would take on the design of a small pavilion that was a part of their civic square. And so the concept for this project was uh, in part developing sort of a clear idea for a transparent pavilion within a civic square, but it was also a chance to explore some new ideas for the office uh, that I was interested in that could be explored uh, at a very small controlled scale and sort of perfected that scale before those elements could sort of move and evolve into larger buildings. So here we, at the Civic Square, we can see that it's, it's composed around sort of one large move, which is uh, a large oval reflecting pool, splash pad, and ice rink. And around that are a series of sort of playfully located green oval berms. Uh, and then our uh, project here is uh, an elliptical form that's located adjacent to a service lane that provides access to underground service space within the city hall. At the lowest level of the building, this is really the piece that's pure infrastructure. It's not accessible to the public. Uh, it's a space that has mechanical and electrical equipment that provides service to the pavilion and also to the Civic Square. It has a large underground gray water uh, cistern that provides the water for the splash pad as well as for the plumbing fixtures in the building and a large chiller uh, that provides um, services to the ice rink in the winter months. At grade, this is the plan here. You see it's an elliptical plan. Uh, within the elliptical plan, there is a, a sort of twisting elliptical core uh, that helps to organize the public spaces of the pavilion, which are places for people to sit, to rest, to put on their skates, or to use the, the larger of the washrooms for private change. There's lockers and shafts located in a sort of off-center uh, service spine that also has a stair that takes one down to the lower level infrastructure components. And then the final piece at grade is uh, a parking space for a Zamboni machine, uh, which you can see here uh, passes through the building as it goes and clears uh, snow shavings from the ice rink. It comes through the building and dumps them adjacent to the service lane. Uh, adjacent to the City Hall building. Here's a longitudinal section through the building uh, that again illustrates the at grade public components of the pavilion, the space for Zamboni uh, storage and parking, the underground uh, wa gray water cistern, as well as the space for the, the chiller and other mechanical equipment. You can see in the plan we're dealing with an elliptical shape, we chose the ellipse over an oval, which was the, the, the primary form used on site uh, because it, it was sort of a more interesting shape to, to work with, but it, it gave us a chance to look at a continually changing radius around the exterior, the perimeter of the building and looking at multiple radii uh, and bent glass that could produce the multiple radii for the, for the perimeter condition. Um, the, the ceiling uh, is also an elliptical uh, shape as well as the core. Uh, the ceiling has a bowl shape to it. So it's introducing a, a piece of uh, organically uh, curving compound curvature, complex geometry. Uh, and the core is an ellipse that as it extrudes uh, is intended to twist and then merge with the bowl shape of the ceiling. Uh, and uh, so 
you know, having a building that's this small and controlling these kinds of studies allows us to see how we might resolve these kinds of uh, sort of, confluence of confluences of geometric complexity. Cross sections through the building, which again illustrate the bowl shape to the ceiling uh, and how the elliptical uh, core merges with that ceiling uh, and a place where we formerly had a skylight that was cut out. But and now looking at a three-dimensional image that illustrates the program a little bit more clearly, where we can see the space for the Zamboni machine, the two cores, the public space of the pavilion. We can see the multiple radii curving glass uh, at the leading edge of the pavilion and some large oversized vents for a passive natural ventilation within the pavilion. And a small exploded exonometric that shows the parts, again, underground infrastructure, gray water pavilion, space of the pavilion for the public, uh, curtain wall with integrated lighting, uh, the envelope and the bowl shaped roof. And here we can see uh, again the, the sort of smooth bowl shape of the ceiling and we can see the elliptical shape of the core and the way in which that core engages with the geometry of the ceiling and how it's been resolved. So as I mentioned, a big part of the concept was experimentation. Um, and so part of that was, was uh, trying to understand how to design for these kinds of shapes. Uh, both in terms of the envelope as well as these plaster shapes for the core and ceiling shapes. So part of that was introducing new programs, new software to the office. And the other part was, was thinking about how it could be fabricated. And we looked at a variety of different methods for fabrication, including fiberglass and, and fabric and, and pre-manufactured metal panels. Uh, but all of those things were far too expensive for this project, which had, a, which had a very modest budget, as do all of our public projects. So at the end of the day, what we found was that we could really attempt to achieve everything we wanted using very standard components. And, and really that's what a, a lot of our architecture is, is sort of based on or mine anyhow, is customizing sort of off the shelf standard products and sort of twisting and torquing and, and modifying them uh, sort of to the greatest extent for an expressive effect. So here we can see uh, how this uh, core element, the plaster elements were built. You can see that it's, it's built using off the shelf framing components <clears throat> that are sort of uh, triangulated uh, and give a sort of approximation of the form. You can see how plywood was used in order to create a ribbing effect that, that starts to mediate between the vertical surface and the bowl shape of the ceiling. Uh, a, a plaster lath, again off the shelf lath, was riveted to the framing material and then it was really just layers of plaster that was applied and sanded in order to create the sort of final effect of sort of a smooth piece of compound curvature which is resolved as it engages from one plane to another and we can see again the sort of constantly changing radius of the envelope uh, and the curving glass that was used in order to create that effect. And then finally, an image of the project from sort of the center of the reflecting pool looking back toward uh, the pavilion. So that leads me to the second project, which is the Springdale Library. And this is project is sort of like a cousin to that first project. And it takes a lot of the lessons that were learned there and, and it expands it both in terms of scale and complexity uh, to the scale of a public branch library. So the Brampton, Brampton Springdale Library is uh, both a branch library and a neighborhood park. And, and we designed both parts of, of that program. This plan diagram illustrates what is essentially a triangular building. So the boundary condition of the building is, is triangular, but the actual building envelope is amorphous and it has a series of, of perimeter courtyards uh, that sort of undulate and create a, a, a varying types of relationships to the landscape. In section, uh, there has been an attempt to create a series of, of sort of fluid organic geometries that organize the space of the park through a series of sort of berms and swales. And that organic geometry is sort of pulled into the space of the library and helps to organize that space. The building is situated in Brampton, the community of Springdale. It is a very sort of typical traditional suburban uh, neighborhood. We can see in the aerial photograph here, this is our, our building site. Uh, when we got the site, there was a large piece of vacant land, which has become a large, very typical um, suburban strip mall with sort of the usual suspects of McDonald's and shoppers and, and gas station, et cetera. 
Uh, and the rest of the fabric is primarily suburban residential, which we can see pretty much on all sides. The one sort of nice element that was that was given to us was, or that we found on site was this uh, existing low ravine, which arcs around two sides of our site. And looking at our site in a bit more detail, it's a bit light here to see, but it really is kind of an amorphous shape. Uh, the first position that we took on site was to locate the building, the library as close to the, to the street as possible. So uh, that is in what is more or less a sort of triangular area of the site. And that really is why the building has a triangular shape. Parking was uh, put to the rear of the site adjacent to the main drive aisle, the neighborhood park protected in the back corner of the site adjacent to the ravine and a set of contemplative gardens protects this edge of the library. The site itself uh, was fairly uninteresting, flat brownfield kind of site. Uh, and there was sort of generally an approach in the landscape and within the architecture too of, of cut and fill where we uh, cut areas of the site in order to create sort of subtle subterranean, subterranean zones within the library and then use the fill in order to help create a variety of spatial conditions within the park. The site plan on the left here sort of illustrates all the main components, the library here with its perimeter courtyards, parking uh, to the rear of the site, the neighborhood park located here that has a splash pad, uh, a neighborhood park equipment space, children's park equipment area, shade pavilion and a series of terraced contemplative gardens here. And we can see a detailed shot of uh, one of the uh, perimeter courtyards. This is the one uh, located here, which provides access to the building from the street corner. And there's a floor plan on the right here, which illustrates the sort of general layout of the library. Again, we can see the undulating perimeter condition uh, on these three sides, we can see the uh, courtyard, which relates pedestrian movement from the corner that brings pedestrians into a shared entry condition, which also gives access to uh, an entry um, that brings people in from the parking areas or gives access to the neighborhood park. And then the final indentation here relates to a series of terraced contemplative gardens. And there's a reflecting pool. There's a series of reflecting pools within the terrace gardens and also a larger one that separates the play areas for the children from the contemplative gardens. Uh, a, a, a longitudinal section through the site in the building, which again illustrates the use of these sort of organic shapes in order to create berms and swales within the landscape of the park to sort of zone the space as well as provide interest and then a sense of drawing that geometry into the space of the library where we have a lower uh, sort of semi -sub subterranean zone in the library here, two levels to the library slab. So a topography at, at, at grade, as well as a sort of corresponding ceiling topography here, uh, which creates a series of sort of fluid geometries that descend and mark areas like the children's area or sort of rise and ascend to create large reading atria spaces or smaller reading zones. And there's a corresponding roof geometry uh, and envelope, which is, as you can sort of make out in the image here, a, a sort of hilltop that's situated on the roof of the building, which again uses this uh, a process of resolving complex geometry to create sort of smooth organic hilltop geometries. Uh, so like what we saw with the Guelph Pavilion, you can see that, that these geometries are really built out of very simple rudimentary off the shelf products. We can see off the shelf drywall framing elements and here rather than the uh, gypsum wallboard, or sorry, rather than the plaster, We've used thin gypsum wallboard that can be sort of cut and distorted and twisted in order to create the shape and then be finished into something that looks very fluid uh, and very organic. And then some images of the final space here. This is the large central reading atrium with this kind of soaring space that takes geometries that are filleted triangle, that is a, a filleted triangle and torques it and modifies it as it rises to become a circle and an oculus at the top of the atrium. On the right, uh, an image that illustrates the boundary condition, the sort of perimeter condition of the, of the library, which is bounded by a very fine stainless steel canopy and a series of very fine stainless steel columns. And you can also see the indentation of one of the undulating perimeter courtyards. 
an image uh, within the park that again illustrates the organic geometries of the berms within the park and how they sort of relate to the hilltop on the roof and the geometries of the ceiling space behind the glass or through the glass here. And an overview that illustrates uh, the sort of full scope of the project, the library uh, and the neighborhood park. You can see again, the sort of geometries within the park and on the rooftop. You see that the park has been organized around uh, a word. The word is imagine, and it's uh, made up of a series of five meter high letters that are either placed vertically or horizontally, and we can sort of make out the I-M-A-G-I-N-E. A few more images inside the building illustrating those geometries, and here on the left, that sort of idea of sort of deconstructing the boundary between the inside and the outside of the building. We can see some of the park space and those geometries outside and the corresponding interior geometries and finishes that create this kind of perceptual relationship between interior and exterior environments. And some detail images, again, of the colonnades and screens outside, the contemplative gardens on the right, with a series of uh, planted areas and reflecting pools that bring people roughly two feet down below grade to a sort of quiet contemplative zone. And some more images of uh, the geometry inside the project and the undulating envelope, shade structure in the landscape, uh, and an overview that illustrates a bit more clearly the organic geometries of the hilltop that's found on the roof. And then finally, an image uh, of the same basic area at dusk. Uh, illustrating both the envelope, uh, the colonnade, and the terraced uh, garden space. And finally, I'm going to move on to the Scott Street Interlocking Signal Tower project, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, is really a pure piece of engineering infrastructure. This is uh, a, a, a generator enclosure. So it's a project for Metrolinx, and it was to provide space for a new emergency power generator for Union Station. And this aerial photograph shows the uh, historic head house of Union Station here, uh, the train shed canopy, and then the sort of sinuous lines of the tracks leading into the platform space. And this pink uh, rectangle here illustrates the Scott Street interlocking signal tower, which is uh, a historic signal tower, comes from a time uh, that maybe is sort of uh, having a renaissance right now where the city put a bit more sort of effort into the architecture associated with infrastructure. Uh, the existing building uh, is located here. Uh, the new generator enclosure is here. Uh, and there's a reveal space in between. And one of the reasons for that reveal space is an existing generator that's situated right here that had to be maintained during construction to be decommissioned after the new generator was up and running. So one of the things that we wanted to do with this project was to sort of conceptually enter into a kind of thoughtful dialogue between the existing heritage building and the new pavilion for the generator. And one of the things that we were looking to do was to honor the facade by creating a, a kind of a duplicate facade that matched the same dimensions of the existing building uh, although a sort of contemporary version, a kind of reflective shroud next to this existing heritage building. So in order to create that dimension, we had to sort of work around the existing generator. And one of the things we decided to do was sort of stretch that building facade to create the precise dimension that we wanted. Some sections through the building, a longitudinal section showing the space of the generator uh, and a cross section showing the complexity of the site. You can see the elevated rail tracks here. We can see the Gardner Expressway here, Lakeshore Avenue, and then really our address is on a vehicle off ramp when we come down from the Gardner Expressway and pass by. So it is publicly accessible. You can walk by this building, but it's sort of hard to get to and, and more easily seen by cars. Uh, some elevations of the building, again, sort of illustrating this sort of pairing of facades. And just looking at the sort of general parts of the project, the site, the Scott Street Tower, the new generator uh, pavilion, the vehicle off ramp, the paired facades, the rail lines, the reveal space, the ventilation patterns for the enclosure, and a sort of analysis of existing geometry that's sort of found its way into the new, into the new uh, pavilion. So anytime we're working with heritage buildings, um, we do go through a fairly exhaustive uh, exercise of sort of analyzing the existing architecture to understand it and take cues from it. 
So these are some of those diagrams that we developed. This is sort of illustrating regulating lines that are horizontal, uh, sort of analyzing uh, sort of eave lines and decorative lines and sort of stretching those lines across over into the space of the facade for our new pavilion and vertical alignments that are illustrating again, very simply matching the dimension of the existing facade and replicating it in this new reflective shroud. Some other geometry that we looked at, the uh, signal tower had sort of a distinctive roof, which was a kind of a, a, a hip roof that's been stretched at the very end. So it creates this sort of faceted arcing geometry. Uh, and it has a, a series of uh, arched windows that have arched decoration. And so queuing off of those, when we started to resolve junctures and issues, we looked at uh, sort of filleted arcing lines. So we can see, as I mentioned before, the sort of arcing resolution of how a short facade becomes a longer facade. And then the arcing geometry of how uh, a sidewalk element sort of rises to become a retaining wall. And then the sort of notion of creating this confluence of ge geometric complexity that we need to resolve and creates kind of an interesting moment here. Uh, an image illustrating diagrammatically the uh, envelope for the building. It is an open air building. Uh, it has uh, a, an aluminum panel system that is either a flat panel or uh, panels that open. And those openings relate to uh, the, the sort of precise ventilation requirements for the new generator. So those have been sort of pre precisely mapped onto the surface of the facade in order to allow natural ventilation. Uh, and then some rendered images. This is illustrating the west facade. We can see the building again uh, starting in one elevation plane and radiusing and stretching to become a wider elevation, which creates a sort of exact duplicate dimension to the heritage building. And then we can also see the sort of filleted and arcing line of the retaining wall that comes up and that sort of point of intersection. Uh, and then an image uh, in perspective that illustrates on the left, the signal tower. We can see the reveal space and the arcing plane of the uh, retaining wall, as well as the sort of new facade of the generator. And at certain vantage points, the way that that facade being stretched becomes a very delicate sort of knife edge condition. An image from the other direction, illustrating a bit more clearly the uh, architecture of the signal tower. Uh, the reveal space and the generator and the sort of ventilation fenestration pattern. An image uh, sort of elevational perspective that again just illustrates this notion of a dialogue between old and new buildings, these very subtle cues uh, of organization uh, and dimension that are attempting to make subtle relationships to the existing building but to sort of honor that existing architecture. Uh, kind of a crude image of, of, the, um, of the building during construction, but this is sort of well under construction and should be done uh, sometime in the spring. And then finally, just ending off where I began uh, back with the sketches, and that finishes my, my talk and I'll hand things back over to, uh, to Ben. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, really wonderful presentation. It's great to see all the important work underway in your office. Uh, now I'll uh, pass quickly to Ben uh, to introduce Ray Chow and GH3. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, when we try these formats of getting multiple speakers, uh, you know, you worry about cutting people short. Uh, what I'm realizing is, oh my God, it really leaves us wanting more. So fantastic, Tyler, that was <laughs> great. And thank you so much for uh, to sh showing projects which really keep to the theme of the, um, of the lecture tonight. Um, great. So over to uh, GH3. GH3 is an award-winning Canadian design practice focusing on the increasingly complex overlap between architecture, urbanism, and landscape. The firm uh, couples a modernist eye for order, beauty, and social possibility with an environmentalist's awareness of sustainability and long-term thinking. The firm strives to produce pragmatic, poetic, environmentally responsible, and aesthetically powerful design solutions fueled by the belief that excellent design is an essential part of everyday life and that spaces and places can inspire joy and civic pride. GH3's project run the gamut from small park pavilions and private houses to large civic and transit infrastructure, and most recently, Canada's first natural swimming pool for the city of Edmonton. The firm's work has been published widely and received numerous awards, notably Governor General's medals for the Borden Park Natural Swimming Pool the Borden Park Pavilion, 
the real-time control building number three, and a photographer's studio uh, over a boathouse. GH3 was named one of the world's 20, 20 most innovative companies in 2020 by Fast Company for their projects related to, to urban water. Raymond Chow, our presenter this evening, graduated from Carlton, uh, Carlton's Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism with a B Arc in 1999 and a master's degree in 2002. He joined GH3 in 2006 and became a principal in 2015. We're extremely pleased to welcome him back to Carlton as a speaker in this year's lecture series. So over to you, Ray. Great. Well, thank you, Ben, uh, for that introduction. Um, assuming everybody can hear me. All good. Okay, great. I'm just gonna expand this. <clears throat> um, so um, thank you, Ben and uh, Carlton and everyone here for uh, having me here. It's great to be back. Um, <clears throat> so when Ben uh, initially approached uh, us about the theme of reassembly uh, with a, a lens through our infrastructure projects, uh, there, there were a couple of projects that, uh, that were obvious uh, uh, that we picked out that were, we felt well poised to, to talk about the contemporary relationship uh, between infrastructure and everyday life. Uh, both projects share uh, very similar baselines and frameworks uh, of which were a product of change and uh, adaptation to evolving conditions. Uh, as well, both are very small projects, um, but relative uh, to the impact they have, play uh, pretty significant roles uh, with regards to uh, the role of water uh, and infrastructure that carries, uh, carries it through their, their respective cities. Uh, so uh, when I'm gonna talk about these projects, I just kind of wanted to speak to our process uh, some of the fundamental approaches and principles we, we draw upon uh, when, we, when we go about designing the buildings, um, our reading and analysis, and some of the key decisions that we made during the production uh, of the building. Uh, um, but before I, I dive into to all that, just a little bit about uh, GH3. I was started by Pat uh, back then, and when she started the office, she had a, you know, a strong, uh, a strong sense of conviction that the role of, and, and uh, overlap of architecture and landscape ha had to be beautiful and compelling in order to be able to uh, be of any influence to the character of, of any place, uh, the surroundings, uh, and especially in shaping our behavior and attitudes towards the built environment. Uh, I was a young and uh, naive architect uh, when I joined GH3 in about 2007. Uh, and uh, Pat uh, mentored me throughout my development uh, of my career and uh, and I became partner of the firm in 2015. Uh, and throughout the years, uh, the, I guess the, the practice had, has intentionally uh, evolved through a variety, a wide variety of building typologies uh, with a willingness to sort of take on, uh, you know, the most uh, uh, obscure types. <clears throat> Recent events have continued to highlight some of the pressures uh, and disruptions to our daily lives that. Uh, you know, we continue to face, uh, you know, uh, with our, uh, the challenger our current infrastructure capacities, policies, and, and cultural attitudes. Uh, storm uh, events in particular uh, continue to remind us about, you know, how important it is to, to manage our water systems, uh, as, as it is only for forecasted to, to get even worse. And, and, you know, a lot of it's attributed to climate change, uh, but as well, uh, urban intensification of cities, uh, you know, we'll also continue to add uh, add to the pressure of providing more uh, necessary infrastructure uh, to support to, to support uh, new the, the new growth of communities. Uh, and as architects, we you know we typically find ourselves most involved uh, in a collective effort with you know various disciplines, uh, municipalities, uh, industry stakeholders, uh, and whatnot, in, in sort of navigating the existing frameworks uh, and to come up with new and creative ones, uh, just you know to help uh, adapt to some of these changing conditions. In speaking about urban, urban hydrology, I think the, you know the, the story of water is, is a really important one to tell and understand because you know how we understand and manage our water systems really uh, you know directly impacts our approach towards resilience in protecting the water sources, uh, you know, including watersheds, rivers, and ecosystems, uh, and, and use water flows, for instance, uh, just for future and uh, for current and future generations. And it's, it's also equally as important to communicate, educate, and empower the public, uh, the public, uh, the role of water in all aspects of the day-to-day -day life. Um, and it's really up to us as architects, uh, you know, we're, we're charged with this critical role 
that we channel our creativity uh, with others uh, into you know beautiful and engaging productions. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're stewards of what can you know stimulate interest and activate a, you know, a greater awareness uh, of of the role that these productions can play. Um, just as you know, the life of the city runs in like a, like a electricity through the veins and arteries of the city on on the surface. Um, you know, the, the hidden weaving of utilities and infrastructures that connect us below are are, are just as vital to, to the life it services above. Uh, and you know, pictured here is, is really a typical view that we as architects and engineers get to get the pleasure of seeing all the time. Uh, but but to everyone else, you know, this is what we're 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 very used to seeing, and it's, you know, typically relegated to you know the background background noise of the day to day. And there's a, you know a constant dialogue between cities and their citizens. Uh, in this blog that I you know really enjoy, it's called the uh, Ninety Nine Percent Invisible. Uh, it's a podcast. Um, it, it actually highlights some of those places, uh, some of those pieces in the city's infrastructure that sits, you know, most often in the background, uh, and at times just, you know, right in front of our, right, right, right in front of us. Uh, and it's this dialogue and relationship between infrastructure and, and cities that, you know, really doesn't reflect the the impact and importance of their role in the city. You can argue that, you know, it, it's kind of parallel to the hard. You know, parallel to the hard infrastructure that facilitates these systems, are, are, are the is the you know cultural infrastructure and knowledge of uh, what these systems do for us, uh, and, and that the lack of any sort of significant signification of the systems that run our cities really uh, more or less mirrors uh, our, our awareness and understanding of what they do. Um, and it's not really that we need to see all that stuff that happens below us. You know the occasional steam from a manhole or fumes or gas lines and you know all those things you know they're, they're hidden for and concealed for obvious reasons mentioned in in that podcast are also our, our uh, they've, they've highlighted a few buildings in toronto that hide these uh, you know the, these infrastructure buildings in, pictured here are some hydro buildings that are hidden in plain sight amongst uh, single family homes and it's just interesting to, to think about these things and imagine that you know if this area were to change into like a mid-rise or mid-rise uh, mixed use zone, uh, that these would just be, you know, standalone pieces uh, of their own time. But, you know, with intensification and urbanization, what, what naturally, what happens is we are naturally capped the porous surfaces that, you know, would have absorbed all of the precipitation, but instead, you know, all of that polluted runoff is, is diverted uh, to the below grade networks, you know, through catch basins, uh, and most commonly uh, it's, it's diverted into our lakes and streams. And as a practice, our, um, you know, we, we, we typically consider a lot of the conveyance of water within our own building sites and with, you know, natural permeability or porosity um, as, as, a, as, a, as a sort of integral part of the whole production of the, of the building design and the site as well. And uh, you know, while a city's sustainable sustainability policies uh, guide developments of sites uh, to absorb their own water uh, on public surfaces such as streets and sidewalks, you know, the mechanical conveyance of water, urban water really needs to be treated uh, and cleansed before uh, you know entering the natural systems in order to protect them. Uh, and you know, the relationship between art and infrastructure, you know, that is really well preserved in, in, in Roman art aqueducts. Uh, was 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 kind of lost uh, as the modern world started to bury everything, everything underground. You know, whether it's outside of cities or camouflaged, you know, they become out of sight and therefore uh, really just out of mind. And in the project you're about to see, you know, we, we try to present a contemporary intentionality behind the structure uh, and an inversion from the underground that is uh, out of sight to something that's more iconic um, <clears throat> and, and something to really signal, you know, give a sense of what's happening below. Uh, a Burned and Hilla Becker's uh, uh, photography works are, are, are really fantastic works that elevate our, the conversation about infrastructure uh, on an aesthetic level and, and really al allow us to perceive and understand and establish an appeal towards this typology. Um, and, you know, the beauty of, 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 of such basic forms it really underscores their simplicity, uh, clear, clarity and, and legibility that, you know, anyone can, can kind of connect with and starts to celebrate the spirit of that essential form and really what's what's necessary 
kind of harkens back to, you know, the corpse, the machine for a living as well. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, so the, the pandemic has been a real challenge for everyone. And it's, you know, continue to highlight that some of the importance of having access to outdoor spaces, for, you know, for many reasons, you know, to stay connected, you know, ease our anxieties and, and keep our mental and physical health in check. Uh, the North Saskatchewan River in Edmonton is home to uh, many of these recreational spaces uh, for its citizens, but uh, you know, as you can see, it's also subject to uh, contamination. CSOs or confined sewer outfalls uh, can really put a damper on some of these amenities uh, and you know render them pretty much off limits because of health reasons and safety reasons. Um, it, and it's really another subtle reminder of the fragility of our water systems and, and the real need to protect them. Uh, the, the West Edmonton Sanitary uh, Sewer System, um, in this case, it's called the Water, the W12 Siphon Project. It, it's part of this, uh, it's one of the uh, uh, projects uh, and it's part of the city's program and, and plan to target some of these uh, major outflow structures. Uh, in this case, it's the, uh, the Rat Creek Crossing uh, outfall, which is uh, close to uh, downtown Edmonton. Uh, and in, in this case, in particular, this outfall was responsible for 60 to 80 percent of the annual CSOs. Uh, the site's located uh, just at the corner of Jasper and 84th Avenue, uh, and uh, it's uh, sited along the upper banks of the Edmonton River Valley, surrounded by a growing residential neighborhood and whatnot. The, the, the siphon runs right below the site uh, down into the valley and below the river, and then uh, comes back up and uh, makes its way to the uh, the new Gold Bar Waste uh, Wastewater Treatment Center. Uh, as you can see, it's a highly visible site uh, from the north, uh, east, and the west side, and directly south. You can see uh, right over the uh, the river valley, and so and as such, it really play. It, it's a uh, the site. In itself, it's, it plays a crucial role in creating and punctuating this public space uh, along the river's edge, uh, and it became really apparent to us that you know the building uh, needed to, to have a recognizable form that would create a, a new reference point in the neighborhood. Uh, pictured here is just a piping plan that shows the existing uh, CSO uh, pipe that's sort of shown in the uh, uh, the orange there and uh, being intercepted by the new siphon that would divert all of that water to the treatment plant. Here's a diagram just showing how flows from that siphon barrel uh, and existing uh, combined sewer are controlled by a, a, this real-time uh, control facility here. Uh, and the way it does it is it opens and closes some gates uh, uh, according to some of the drainage conditions uh, at, at the time. Uh, so it's, and it's connected by a series of pipes and shafts that link up below the site uh, with the main uh, concrete shaft uh, coming up through the building that uh, gets covered up by our, uh, the veil. Uh, the building structure uh, itself consists of two gates uh, and, and a diversion gate. Uh, the diversion gate here, hopefully you can see my mouse, is this dotted structure here. And um, during large storm events, what happens is that uh, this removable roof hatch is removed by a truck that comes along with a big uh, uh, picker and it just removes that and then drops this, uh, removes it from the building and drops it into one of the uh, shafts that, are just shit, that, that just sits outside the site uh, of the building. Within the building itself, inside the concrete shaft uh, are, are the control gates. Uh, and they use real-time measurements and operational uh, algorithms um, that dynamically manages the flow rate uh, below the building. Uh, part of the goals uh, uh, for, the, for the building was to reduce the uh, outfall events uh, by up to 80%. So uh, to, to put that in perspective, that's about uh, 49 events. They wanted to reduce it to 10. And um, in the first year alone, they actually reduced it down to one. So uh, about a 90% reduction. So not only has it improved the water quality of the river, but it's also re uh, resulted in, uh, in, in improved aquatic habitats and far less odor and the corrosion at Rat Creek. Uh, the telegraphing of the below grade network and geometry onto the landscape of the RTC 
starts to create um, a new open space and an accessible uh, space around the corner, as you can see how close it is uh, to, to the existing intersection. Uh, and the proposed uh, pedestrian pavement layout seamlessly uh, integrates the, the existing uh, public sidewalk network as well as connecting it to the uh, adjacent sites uh, of residential uh, developments uh, to the west and the north. The building itself is about uh, 100 square meters. So it's, again, it's not, not, not a big building. And for the most part, it, it sits empty until uh, you know, the maintenance crews come and, and check up on the, uh, the monitoring equipment inside the building. Uh, but because of the heavy machinery and the amount of trucks that need to come and service the building, uh, the, the, the site itself had to be capped uh, with, with a solid surface. So in dealing with the stormwater itself and any precipitation, we diverted all of that uh, water into the catch basins that you can see in the circles outside the building footprint as well, uh, just to the left uh, in, into the planters along the, uh, along the western edge. <clears throat> and like all of our projects, uh, the production of the work really begins with a rigorous and exhaustive process of exploration. You know, uh, from iterative attempts from different directions and angles. Uh, we, we produce a lot of options that we quite often discuss on Friday afternoons over drinks. And really the work serves like a catalyst for, uh, for uncovering and, and asking questions about the site and, and allows us to develop a, a, a better understanding and, and relationship with it. Uh, and, and to that end, it really uh, starts to help us uh, uh, craft and hone our response uh, to the, to the site itself. As you can see here, I think where we arrived to was that the cylindrical form um, in the end seemed to allow the building to, to achieve uh, its, its required close proximity to the street edge uh, while maximizing any uh, potential negative effects that this may have around the surrounding streetscape. And what we really wanted to do was encourage pedestrians into the site and uh, create new connection and shortcuts between existing sidewalks and routes. Uh, here are just some more explorations that we did of that cylindrical form. But we ultimately decided on, uh, on using glass blocks as uh, they, they have a long-standing relationship, uh, a long-standing uh, and a proven track record with the, the city of Edmonton and, and their maintenance crew, and um, and also a, a fairly successful material used in many infrastructural buildings uh, and civic buildings as well, seen in the city. Uh, and what we did here, as you can see, is we mocked up uh, a couple of scenarios uh, just to test out some of the qualities uh, of light uh, and, and transparencies uh, that we could achieve uh, with, with the glass block. Um, just a little bit about how we do this. And we rely a lot on photorealistic imaging, uh, a lot of renderings uh, to facilitate a, a lot of exploration. Uh, in this case in particular, we actually modeled uh, the, the hollow casting of the block uh, to really give us the reflective and refractive qualities. Uh, and, and that allowed us to really sort of study some of the, the different conditions and, and options that we, uh, uh, that, 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 that we thought could, could make it into the final production of the building. Some, you know, more uglier <laughs> than the next. Um, a few more images of that. But it was really when we, put it on a diagonal that it started to feel uh, and really it started really to speak to us in a, in a very familiar tone but in a, in a renewed one as well and it was really just a simple flipping of the block on the uh, on the 45 that 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 started uh, started the building exploration on a different path here's just another image of a close-up of that rendered block In this image, you start to see how we started to explore uh, different reflective qualities, uh, different profiles of the block, as you can see on the lower right, and then uh, on the lower left-hand side, a, a satinated block. The five, so the, the facade is entirely wrapped with this material. So what we wanted to do was give it, uh, the overall effect we, want, we wanted it to have was an ephemeral feeling that would constantly change uh, with the, uh, you know, according to the different light conditions 
uh, during the time of the day. Here's an image of a rendered image of the uh, the upper roof parapet, and here's one of the final outcome. But it's really important uh, to note uh, that at this point, uh, a small but important detail that really made the, the project, uh, which was this special block that we were able to have produced for the building. Uh, and, and it really allowed us to achieve some of the more precise moments uh, around. Um, but that said, we also consulted a lot of the uh, installers and in industry uh, in, in the city uh, that had done a lot of the installs of this just to test and, and, and assume and, and help us realize some of our assumptions uh, because of the tolerance that was required for this. And uh, with that, we, develop, we were able to develop some details that we were fairly confident about in, in, executing, in executing the building. It was really fun to, to watch them put up. I think it took them maybe about a week and a half uh, to set up the bottom course uh, uh, and, and uh, start going up from there. And apologies for the quality of this image, but um, what they did was they actually set up a perimeter sort of rim that they str uh, strung these uh, cords of string all the way down to the bottom that guided the masons uh, all the way up the building. And it wasn't really until they got to the top of this door frame where everybody sort of breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, because as you can imagine, anything above this was a continuous uh, band of, of, of blocks. So uh, it, was, it was a real, real sharing point for us. And just some uh, more final images of the building as I move through it. And it was a conscious decision to select and, and, and continue uh, producing, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna flip back here, uh, to select elements uh, for the building, such as this bollard here to, to sort of speak to some of the character characteristics of the, of the building itself, that being a cylinder. And it's interesting to take a look uh, to see in this image uh, above is when we first started the project, it was literally uh, not much around except for single family homes. And by the time we finished on the bottom, uh, it was pretty much uh, the surrounding area had fully developed. I'm just going to flip through some of the uh, the final images uh, that were taken as uh, the building was finished. Bringing us back to Toronto. So Toronto is really no stranger to the tradition of celebrating civic buildings. And we can't discuss Toronto's history without mentioning R.C. Harris, uh, who played a critical role in establishing the network of water reservoirs, sewer trunks, and filtration plants that dramatically improved the city's uh, public health standards and laid the groundwork for uh, Toronto's outward, uh, outward expansion in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the, the evolution of modernized Toronto has continued to evolve from his fingerprints uh, and all of his public works achievements, where he oversaw many of the city's modernized, uh, modernized uh, modernization projects, such as the Prince Edward uh, or the Bluer Street uh, Viaduct, the Victoria Park filtration plant, now known as the R.C. Harris plant, uh, also known as the Palace of Purifications that can be found in um, Don Che's uh, uh, Skin of a Lion and as well as the Sinclair Reservoir, um, just uh, by Sinclair and uh, Spadina Road. But what really separated uh, him from his contemporaries at the time was the, his appreciation of the arts uh, and the high design for both buildings and landscape. Um, and in quoting Pat in one of her most recent interviews, if you make infrastructure uh, legible and beautiful, the public gets interested, asks questions, and assumes ownership of uh, of what are the uh, what are among the most built important buildings in any city. And this is very true of the R.C. Harris Building and the legacy it's it's left behind for us. Uh, it's also attracted the likes of Aldo Rossi, who, when he visited uh, Toronto in the 1980s, uh, said that this was probably one of the most powerful buildings in Canada. 
and was actually host to uh, one of his uh, portable theaters. But as you know, Toronto is a city that continues to grow. Um, pictured here is a um, archival image capturing Toronto's industrial past with our site circled uh, there in, in, the, in red. With rising demands for housing and, and you know, our aging infrastructure, we of course need to continue updating and renewing our infrastructure as the city continues to evolve. And you know, with that, of course, uh, comes new opportunities to renew uh, the baseline and chapter for recognizing infrastructure in new ways um, that really allow us to rethink our relationship with you know water and the, and the infrastructure. <clears throat> the, the stormwater facility in Toronto uh, was a building that we were tasked by a waterfront Toronto uh, who oversee the development of the Portland uh, to integrate into, uh, uh, as you can see, an already congested uh, and infrastructurally intense site. Uh, it sits uh, at the crossroads of many crisscrossing intersections, uh, arterial networks, uh, and, 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 and on a leftover parcel of land. At grade, you have a lot of bicycle networks, pedestrian pathways that connect you to the Martin Goodman Trail and the uh, distillery district just to the north. And as you can see, just on the right-hand side is a residential neighborhood that's uh, up, up and coming. And as well, uh, a, a lot of the vehicular networks, you know, Lakeshore, Lakeshore Boulevard and uh, Gardner Expressway. Uh, and uh, just to the north of the site, you have the uh, CP rail lines, the GO train lines that carry people commuting from the surrounding neighborhoods and suburbs. In other words, it gets a lot of traffic. And as part of Waterfront Toronto's uh, resilience and innovation framework for sustainability, uh, the building is a result of a larger vision of tackling stormwater management. Uh, the integrated system protects communities from flooding by you know, capturing and, and conveying stormwater. Uh, and it also uh, removes the pollutants before directing it uh, into the lake. Um, like the RTC, it's just a little bit bigger. Uh, it's about a 600 square meter building, but relatively small uh, to the size of the, uh, the communities uh, it's, it's to serve. Uh, the facility uses a uh, state-of-the-art technology in a three-step process uh, that uh, removes debris uh, and contaminants from the water. Uh, the water is subject to standard UV light disinfection, uh, dis disinfection uh, being pumped, uh, before being pumped back as clean water into the storm shaft uh, that's pictured here on the, the uh, right-hand side here and then uh, out to the Keating Channel just over here. <laughs> this is a I love this slide. Just gives you the sense and scale of the size of the shaft. Um, here it's a little bobcat being lowered into uh, the, the bottom of the 167 year shaft. Uh, just as in the RTC, we explored a number of options that would most suitably house the equipment, uh, but also stand the test of time in, this, in the busyness uh, of the site. a few models that we did just to take a look at the, the profile of the building. But it wasn't really until we generated this image that we, 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 we felt that the shaft, uh, the, the storm shaft, the surface, and the building had to be connected as one material uh, as a real effective way of, of uh, showing and, and really bringing the below grade to the, to the above. And given the prominence of its location and the, the volume and variety of traffic it already receives, uh, and, and, and will only get much busier than this, uh, the opportunity to convey the story of water through the building and landscape itself uh, became an, an all too important one to tell and, and an opportunity not to miss. And, and we did this by, uh, in this case, we took the rectangular form of the building and started to depress the two opposing corners. And, and by doing this, we were able to, do, to uh, direct the shedding of the roof water into two channels that are etched into the roof uh, and, and walls of the building. And from there, uh, the water uh, goes down into a perimeter gutter around the building, uh, which is further directed down into the central uh, storm shaft. 
uh, pictured here is actually an earlier version of the building before the program doubled in size, which resulted in uh, in a building that uh, doubled doubled in surface area as well. Um, but we were always cognizant of its appearance against the, some of these harder infrastructural elements, being the gardener and the CP rail line, just to the north. <clears throat> Even though it was a cost-driven decision, we uh, yeah, we, we ended up having to strip all of the limestone from the initial design. Uh, but in the end, what we what we did was we uh, ended up with a, uh, an inverted assembly as a concrete barrier wall system. And what that did was it allowed us to maintain the integrity of its uh, the monolithic appearance that we felt the site really needed uh, to be main, maintained on the site. And it's worth pointing out here uh, how you know we really like and develop the, the appreciation for these typologies because there's really not a lot of building types that allow us to design and push the building's conceptual limits uh, in this manner. And as mentioned, we were cognizant of the fact that the gardener concrete piers, uh, you know, served as a backdrop, and that representing this concrete material and in a new fashion would be would, would be a great way of sort of offsetting uh, some of the initial assumptions and understandings and appreciations for the material. In, in utilizing concrete, um, the control joints was probably one of the most fussed about details on this project. And we worked closely with uh, the construction team um, to develop a uh, to develop the, the, the control joints and the board forming. An image of the roof being formed. Uh, and we also realized that, you know, the finish of the concrete was going to be a challenge, especially on uh, a building of this size and magnitude. So uh, earlier on, we, uh, we, we opted to have a sandblasted uh, finish. To, to guarantee uh, that evenness that uh, we wanted to have. And the equipment inside is just as impressive. Just a quick video of how the water is being pumped. Oh, so over on the right is at the top of where the equipment is pumping the water. Uh, flowing down towards us under the grate where you see these guys hanging out. Uh, and then just on the image on the left is where the clean water is being uh, filtered out and then dropped to the UV components, uh, which would be just to the left of here. And, and these are just images not even taken by us, uh, sent, to, sent to us from, from friends and colleagues around. It's really just great to see how it's already starting to generate a lot of curiosity. Just to hear the image during construction, the only one that I could find of the gutter actually working. And I'm just going to flip through some of these slides so that I realize I'm over over my time limit here. But um, just at the building under different lighting conditions. You know, in summary, I think it's the need for creativity. It's critical in thinking about a more resilient infrastructure that not only will solve the issues, but also really serve to elevate our awareness and the importance of investing and celebrating civic structures uh, in, in our built environment. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to say thanks and hand it over to Ben. Great. Thank you so much, Ray. Yeah. I We've been looking uh, in fourth year at, um, put, you know, uh, directed the students to look at River City. Um, I'm trying to get my head around exactly where this last little pavilion is and whether it's actually 
an extension or could be a part of the extension of underpass park um, but uh, i just don't know that corner of toronto or at least i don't know that corner of toronto from ground level very well so uh it looks like it's going to add or it has added to an increasingly uh, fascinating landscape under there thank you so much um for both tyler and uh and and ray I, I, and everyone listening i mean these firms have produced such a, an amazing array of work uh you know i i, I love, we, we have two kinds of presentations, those that kind of say, you know, here, here's who we are and here's everything we've ever done. Um, and and, and the, the, the presentations tonight were quite different. They really focused in on one or two projects, which really allowed us to have a very different focus or lens on, uh, on what they do and how they do it, which is great. But I do encourage everyone to go, uh, you know, at the very least, go to the websites and look at, uh, at the work that uh, RDHA and uh, GH3 are, are doing. Some of it is just... Um, above and beyond what you've seen tonight it's just some of it is just just absolutely stunning makes me extremely uh, proud and optimistic about the uh, uh the prospects of architecture here in canada well we are moving into our our q a session and we uh, promised you we would only spend about 20 minutes doing this um and there are a couple of good questions in review in the uh in the chat room so thank you christopher and thank you mona um but i'm going to turn it over to susie first um and susie i think is going to ask the first question Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, I have a question related to the geography of many of both of the firm's projects, so, which are located in smaller cities. So among other things, this year's forum lecture series explores the impact of demographic shifts on Canadian cities. Uh, we're really trying to focus in on some of those smaller cities. Uh, as our larger cities continue to grow, metropolitan boundaries are extending to include smaller towns farther on the periphery. So here in Ontario, that can include places like Guelph, Cambridge, and Port Credit. Uh, towns in smaller cities like these are increasingly popular destinations, uh, both for young families that are looking to buy homes, but also for older couples who are looking to downsize. Uh, perhaps maybe just start with Tyler, your practice has done some remarkable buildings in smaller towns and cities. Uh, would you say these areas are experiencing a renaissance? And if so, uh, what role does architecture and cultural infrastructure play? Uh, th thanks, Susie. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know um, if they are exactly experiencing a renaissance. They, they may be. I mean, my, my um, experience has been working in both larger municipalities and, and smaller cities and towns. Um, and the, the projects seem to come about for, for similar kinds of, of reasons. Um, either, um, you know, when we're talking about libraries, um, that you know, existing facilities need to be renovated and updated, uh, or in the case of, of building, or in uh, the case of the uh, the Springdale Library, that um, you had a, a, a intensely um, or a quickly growing uh, community uh, that uh, was really underserved just because of the rate at which it was growing, uh, and so a, a new construction was needed. Uh, another another sort of variation has been sort of legacy projects uh, that um, you know perhaps my idea exchange project in Cambridge would would represent where um, there's not so much of a need but but there is uh, an interest in in moving forward with a, sort of an innovative new project that's that's more of a, a legacy project um, so I mean I to, to answer the question, I, I don't know if these cities are necessarily experiencing a, a renaissance or a rebirth of some kind, but the one thing that I would say is that the, the renaissance that I would see uh, is maybe just a, a sort of new emphasis on, on good design, uh, a, a sort of an appreciation for architecture and an interest in, in using architecture in order to sort of redefine a, a brand or to re-energize uh, a certain part of the city. And, you know, I really noticed that um, first when I was working on Blur Gladstone Library and sort of relative to a larger municipal context uh, back in, in the sort of early 2000s when there were a lot of these sort of super build projects and happening in Toronto and we were seeing some significant architects come in and, and build sort of innovative new projects and it helped to sort of rebuild Toronto and, and sort of capitalize using the architecture. And I think a lot of the smaller municipalities have sort of learned from many of those lessons and they, and they sort of see the, the power that great architecture can have on a community, on a city, on, a, on an institution. So I, I think really for, for me, it's sort of the Renaissance is, is more about um, a, a return to, to sort of trying to create great architecture for our, our institutions uh, and what that can do both for the institution and the city. 
Uh, that's great. Thanks, Tyler. I don't know if Ray had anything you wanted to touch on for that one. I uh, know. I think you know. I, I, I sympathize with our, uh, with Tyler on that one. I think you know, as architects, I think being advocates of you know excellent design and, and great quality design is, is is really important for us. Uh, whether you know, big or small, I think in both the projects that we we, we showed, I think uh, it, it it sort of. I mean, I can see those being you know uh, an important thing that we could sort of recognize and reconcile in any scale that in any size of the municipality themselves. Thank you. Um, the, the question I'd like to ask, and this is, uh, I think resonates with the question that Nona posted in the Q and A. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll read the question as I've stated it and then kind of add her comments as well. So Ottawa's new official plan promotes intensification, uh, I should say at all costs. Um, it's been argued that while the city wants higher densities, uh, it has inefficient means and mechanisms to augment and improve the public realm, which is all the more important when people are asked to live closer together you can't add more and more people to the core without significant upgrades to infrastructure and, and this is everything from roads to pumping stations to parks uh, to higher quality streetscapes. Um, Ray and Tyler, your practices both seem to blur uh, the boundaries between infrastructure and architecture. Um, what role can architects and architecture play in these infrastructure projects and how do we as architecture, sorry, how do we as architects uh, turn our focus from individual buildings to the larger public realm? And should we be paying attention to projects that haven't traditionally fell into the realm of architecture? Now, Nona uh, mentions also that it, when we think of, of the transformation of cities um, and the densification and intensification, uh, we tend to think of uh, large amounts of residential units being had by developers. Um, and her question, I guess, is, uh, you know, what about the public realm? What about public architecture? Is the city stepping, are cities stepping up to, to in some ways, complement or augment all of this uh, this new residential infrastructure with uh, the, the kind of public infrastructure uh, that that really needs to to to, to complement it. Uh, she says a, bi a big part of everything that's getting built today is the private housing sector and does not entirely shape public perception, domestic or international, of the unique architectural language of our country. In your opinion, how does public space in Canada differ from uh, other countries? So I guess the question is twofold. One is, um, you know, how do you see your work? Uh, contributing to the public realm and how do you see our perceptions of the public realm changing and infrastructure changing along with it? And secondly, do you think there's, uh, this is always an interesting question, do you think there's something unique about uh, Canada's take on uh, public space? Tyler, we'll start with you. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll, um, I'm just sort of going back to some of these initial questions about um, so the role of, of architects and architecture in, in infrastructure projects. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think um, our, our practice has, has uh, you know, a, a lot of different uh, building types that, that we work on, that they're all public projects. Um, and, you know, some of them may seem more glamorous and, and others may seem more sort of functional or rudimentary in some way, but but I, I think that uh, one of the things that we try to do is, is bring the same level of um, sort of attention to sort of concept, uh, detail resolution and construction uh, to all of the projects that are big or small or regardless of sort of type um, and, and where we can to try and elevate um, the status of, of, of public architecture and infrastructure, and, and particularly those projects that are a bit um, left over or have been left over historically or, or are a bit hidden. And I would even say that with, you know, the branch library. Um, I know we, we sort of think about public libraries as being, you know, significant cultural institutions these days, and there's a lot of examples of, of new public libraries throughout the world. It's gone through a significant transformation. But, you know, when I was working on the Blur Gladstone Library back in 2005, I would say, well, there was a pretty significant um, uh, level of, of design work happening at the scale of the, of the central library. I don't know that the same was true at the branch library. Certainly that wasn't what I, what I noticed when I toured branch libraries throughout the city and, and saw them in other cities. Um, they were 
kind of left over um, in some ways, or at least they were not being built with the same level of, of, of care and detail resolution that would be commensurate with other kind of significant public institutions. So <clears throat> that was certainly a big struggle for us uh, and something that we advocated for all the way through was to really try and elevate the status of, of the public branch library. Um, and, and that is also an approach that we've taken on all other building types that we take on and, and we have been involved in many infrastructure projects. And I'll, I'll mention a, a project by my partner and my partners, Jeff Miller and Bob Goyesh, the Town of New Market Operations Center, which was another project that I, you know, I don't remember seeing um, uh, a, a sort of industrial, municipal industrial building type that was sort of reaching for the level of high architecture in, in Canada before that building. And, you know, I think it was an, a very successful building and a very um, sort of poetic way of, of, of dealing with and designing for uh, sort of large infrastructure projects. And the, and the same can be true, I suppose, of the level of attention that we're trying to give the, the generator enclosure at Union Station. I guess it's sort of just a long way of, of stating that, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, at de designing quality architecture in the public realm is going to sort of elevate the public realm and, and make our uh, sort of public experience uh, more enjoyable. And I think that the task is, is really to try and make sure um, that as architects, we advocate for, for bringing uh, as much effort as possible to all building types that, that we come across. Uh, and to sort of ensure that, that clients continue to be educated through the experience of these buildings and continue to want um, to, to spend the money and the time to produce great architecture, even in areas where things um, may not seem to warrant it. Uh, and so I'll, I don't know if I've answered the question exactly, but I'll pass it over to, to Ray. Ray, do you have any comments on it? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot to unpack in those questions there. And, I mean, in terms of, you know, let's say large scale infrastructure project, I mean, there's one really big one here in Toronto, which is the mouth of the Donlands. Uh, if, we, if we think about that, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that's happening there, you know, everything from mixed use communities and community centers and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, the role of us as architects, uh, you know, we, of course, we play a role in there in, in, in trying to drive as much and to Tyler's points, you know, as much uh, design excellence and, you know, great quality buildings and, and really, you know, pull together, uh, you know, that, that level of energy across all disciplines, uh, whether they be architects, engineers and whatnot. And, but, you know, just to, 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 to further talk about, you know, that, that the project itself as an example, the Waterford Toronto, you have, a, and yet you have a, an organization that's pushing for design excellence as well. So from a, a municipal, and this one's a, a three tiered organization uh, it, it's advocating for that as well so it makes our jobs a lot easier uh, and, and, as well but you know we have our own challenges that we have to meet in terms of meeting some of those standards that are set out um, but you know it, it, in terms of you know going from to, to you know to the individual buildings you know of course with you know in Toronto you know we have our own sites that we have to to deal with uh, and and from you know us as landscape architects and our, and, and, and architects, um, it's it's kind of allowed us to expand our, our our field of vision. Let's say, for lack of a better term, in terms of you know expanding it beyond just the building footprint, and, and really engage the public that way, right? And I think I'm hoping that uh, the project that we had just presented sort of are are, 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 are good examples of that. Um, Thank yeah. You. It, well, I think just in the interest of time, uh, we'll move to one more question. Uh, Susie? Uh, sure. I, shall I just grab one from the Q&A? Uh, the one right in front of me, we have one from uh, Hamza. Uh, the projects shown in the work of RDHA and GH3 in general show a flair for innovation in building form and exterior expression that usually public building clients and owners are very reluctant to support uh, from from their experience in the GTA. Uh, what do you think have allowed your firms to achieve this? Whichever one of you wants to jump in first, feel free. <laughs> um, I guess I'll say, I mean, for us, you know, we had champions right in the beginning. So that was Waterfront Toronto, who, well, to be uh, counterpoint to that, 
what was envisioned for that site at first was actually, a, a, you know, was pitched as a house of all things to, to you know, again, hide the, the building and the, the, the infrastructure that was behind there. So, uh, you know, when, when Artifront uh, took over that project, they said, there's no way in hell we're going to do that. It's got to be, you know, it's given the site, it's proximity to everything and the amount of traffic that was getting, it's, it's got to, you know, be something special. Um, so, of course, you know, having that uh, behind us was, was, a, a, was a real help. Um, but, you know, for the RTC building, uh, I mean, we also had, you know, uh, uh, Carl Boulanger, who's the city architect uh, at, uh, at the city of Edmonton, who also, um, while we didn't really fall within the, some of the typical uh, city of Edmonton projects, it was actually run by a drainage department. There was some level of influence there, but uh, not as much as the other project that we had done at Edmonton, but um, in, in that case, there were there was a lot of education from our side in terms of educating the client, uh, and but then getting educated by the client as of what they're typically used to. So that exchange of, of and that dialogue between what they're used to and what we're used to and how we could we sort of marry some of those things. So for instance, like taking a glass block, something that they're really used to using uh, in, in, in their buildings um, uh, became you know the focal point as to, you know, well, why don't we just do it out of the glass block and literally put a twist to it, right? And, and come up with something special. So uh, something that was very palatable to them, but as well, something that we felt that we could really push the boundaries on as well. That's great. Thanks, Ray. Anything you wanted to add in, Tyler? Could I, maybe I'll just, if I, if I can, Tyler, about your, uh, not only that library, but many of the libraries that you're doing. I think that, you know, the spirit of the question is, um, you know, how do you, how do you get away with it? Some of the, the level of detailing and the, the sophistication of that architecture, um, you know, and when we look at where it, it sits between some suburban houses and a shopper's drug mart, um, I, I can't help but thinking it, it represents aspiration on the part of the community to do better in some ways. I mean, that, that to, you know, when so much of the, the quote unquote public realm is so banal, uh, you know, there, there's a lot riding on that piece of architecture and that, that in some ways the community kind of coalesces around this, this jewel. I don't know if that's, I think that's what we were trying to get at in the first question too, is are our communities soliciting what you do because they see the need to kind of, you know, define themselves or, or you know, get community to coalesce around the building, which, which shows that they're more than just the strip mall and the, and the, and the, and the suburban house? Well, um, you know, it would be nice to think that the, 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 li the, the library systems in the cities were sort of coming to us because they really uh, were inspired by our work. And, and some of them may, may have been, but, you know, we get our projects through a really competitive, you know, public uh, procurement process. Uh, that's point based and not design based and it's and it's tricky to get the jobs in, in the first place. Um, and then, you know, once you have a project like a public library, uh, it's a little different than than maybe some of the infrastructure projects at this point in time. Um, you know, it, people do want something special, you know, I mean, it is it is a, a significant public amenity for the community and they they are looking for something special. Um, but that's not to say that that um, sort of convincing the client group and the stakeholder group is, is not a challenging act because it's, it's very challenging. It's a kind of a battle all the way through. And it's, it's a battle that's won through your own conviction uh, and through your ability to develop sort of clear, uh, sort of legible, uh, expressive ideas that, that can excite people and to do that all the way through the process. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's an act of, of convincing people and it's a, it's an act of not compromising uh, and and you know you, you you know you can be seen as, as being difficult for that reason but um, it, it's it's sort of important to to sort of fight that fight all the way through uh, and um, and it, and it's a difficult process but it's a worthwhile one yeah well, you, you got you your firm has certainly done some remarkable uh, work including a whole series of libraries which are really just just outstanding. We don't unfortunately have time to get to the probably the most key question, which was that blurring of landscape and architecture. Well, landscape, architecture, public realm and infrastructure, the blurring of all those four things that goes on in, in the work of both firms. Um, um, Tyler, I, I, you know, I noticed you were hired uh, to do a piece 
of a larger project by a landscape architect uh, in the in the Guelph project, and then it looked like U.S. the architecture firm took over the realm of designing the landscape around the library, and so you're, you're sometimes acting as a consultant to a landscape architecture and some architect, and sometimes you are acting. Uh, is the role of the landscape architect. So, it, and Ray, the, you know, looking at the work of GH3, landscape is so important. I think you yourself are going for an accreditation by OA, LA, is that right? Without going back to school, Ray, or? <laughs> Ray, you're muted. At least one of the Rays is muted. There he is. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm... Uh, actually, I have to check if I paid my dues. You reminded me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've uh, the intention is yes to. Um, so in the office we have Elise Shelley, who's direct, who's director of uh, landscape architecture here in uh, for, for GH3, and um, and under her guidance and mentorship, I'm I'm trying to uh, obtain my uh, licensure. Uh, time permitting, of course, but yes. Um, but yeah, no, just just to speak to that a little bit, it, it's. It's something that when I was when I, when I joined the firm, uh, it became really apparent of what it has allowed us to do in terms of an office, uh, expand our views into into the public realm that way in different ways that I just would not have thought about before. Um, so it, it was it's very enriching. Uh, it was very enriching uh, in terms of how we approach some of our projects or most of our projects uh, whenever we can to do both. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Uh... Uh, Tyler, I'll give you the last word. Anything you want to say about the blurring of architecture and landscape architecture in your firm? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, landscape, uh, I, I think, is fairly inextricably linked to the conceptual development of all of, of, my, of my projects, uh, even if it's a small sort of tight urban site with a very small landscape component. It's always very carefully... Um, inserted into the the concept for the for the project so i mean it's it's very very important to the development of, of all the concepts and it's uh uh it's something that we definitely lead um so you know we we do work with landscape architects as sub consultants when we're prime consultant but when we are the prime consultant uh and the design architect um we look we lead all aspects of the design of our, of our projects uh and and we do work in collaboration with sub consultants of course but um, it's such an important part uh, that it uh, that it sort of has to be controlled by the overall conceptual process and, and development of that concept. Great. Well, on that note, I I, I want to thank uh, all of you who participated in tonight's presentation, and a special thanks to you, Tyler, and to uh, to Ray. As mentioned earlier, there'll be two more lectures in the forum series this year on February seventh. Mary Rowe uh, from the Canadian Urban Institute will join Partisans Architects to uh, discuss demographic shifts in Canada and their impact on a small town here in Ontario. And for our final lecture, Governor General, General's Award winner Michael Green will be joined by Promise Robotics founder Ramtin Attar to discuss new materials and methods of producing architecture. So please keep an eye out for uh, information on uh, these lectures, which should be coming at you through various channels. So thank you, Susie, um, for co-hosting tonight. And thanks everybody for attending. And special thanks again to Tyler and Ray. We were extremely privileged to have you with us tonight and to get to see your work. Thanks, On that note, thank you. good night, everybody. Good night. Have thank a great you. Great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.